and welcome. Thank you for joining us at Climate Week NYC today. I'm Helen Clarkson, CEO of the Climate Group, and I'll be your moderator. As many of our viewers know, the Climate Group is an international nonprofit with offices in London, New Delhi, and New York. Our mission is to drive climate action fast. Our goal is a world of net zero carbon emissions by 2050 with greater prosperity for all. So the discussion today is about how governments and businesses are achieving a green economic recovery from COVID-19. Our framework for this conversation is looking out across the time horizon of around the next 18 months, so short-term commitments and plans. Our flagship event tomorrow will pick up where today leaves off to discuss how to deliver climate action over the rest of the decade. Do join us for that as well if you can. One of the things I've been most struck by this year is the contrast with the financial crisis of 0809. I was working in sustainability at the time, as I'm sure many of you were, and we were very much told to wait our turn, not try and muddy the waters and talk about economic recovery and environmental messages. The world would get round to the environment when the economy was stable again. But I'm not hearing that message as much this time around. And we should really take a moment to acknowledge how far our movement has come and how we fundamentally changed the general conversation. We surveyed our business members recently and found that 96% believe climate action is just as, if not more important now, compared to pre-COVID times. And this is supported by the general public. According to a recent Ipsos Mori poll, more than 70% of people globally believe that long-term climate change is as serious a crisis as COVID. 59% of our members believe that any financial support from governments to businesses should come with green strings attached, prioritising industries that cut greenhouse gas emissions and create green jobs. We've seen so much change this year. All of us have made huge adjustments to our day-to-day -day lives and most likely the structures of our organisations. This shake-up is so important because it's allowed us to challenge assumptions and shift mindsets in an unparalleled manner. Thank you for being part of the change. And now on to today's agenda. We'll have our first panel, Green Strings Attached, supporting a low carbon economic recovery, exploring policy responses to the pandemic and climate change. Following our first panel, I'll be joined for a conversation with the CEO of NG Impact, Matthias Liliev, our sponsors for The Hub Live. He and I will be exploring how businesses can accelerate their progress towards net zero as part of a green economic recovery. And after that, we move into a segment featuring regional leaders in conversation with Scotland's Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, Rosanna Cunningham, speaking with Sile Zikalala, the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. And then we're we'll finishing up with our second panel, Building a Better Future, Driving Green Growth and Innovation. We've had submissions of questions from those of you who are attending. Thank you very much for these. And please do feel free to tweet along to the event and make sure to follow up with your peers in our chat function too. Hi, I'm now joined by Scotland's Cabinet Secretary for Environment, Climate Change and Land Reform, uh, Rosanna Cunningham, and speaking with Sile Zikalala, the Premier of KwaZulu-Natal province in South Africa. So let's start with asking, uh, how's your government's regional approach different from the national approach in your respective context? Premier, would you like to answer that first? Thank you, and uh, our humble greetings to everyone. And thank you very much, Helen, for your kind introduction and the questions uh, you have asked. Uh, as the province of KwaZulu-Natal and the African region, we wish to start by expressing our collective solidarity with the people of California and the government of California. But we take uh, comfort in the way they have responded in the devastating uh, wildfires and hopefully we will all learn from there. We are dealing with issues of climate change and you will know that Africa as a whole, especially uh, ourselves in the southern Africa, we have suffered a number of uh, disasters, natural disasters, including cyclone which take, took place last year, striking Mozambique, uh, Malawi and, uh, 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 and Zimbabwe. It left uh, more than 1,000 people uh, dead and more than 200,000 were displaced uh, from these countries. Ourselves in the province, we suffered the storm uh, in the Easter uh, last year. I must say uh, the issue of mitigating challenges of climate change 
is part of our constitution as the Republic. But as the province of KwaZulu-Natal, we've launched a number of programs and campaigns that seek to respond to challenges of climate change. And that include working with local communities, creating the awareness about climate change, but also it includes the manner in which we engage with business community in the province through the KZN Growth Coalition, which is a structure that brings together the government, the civil society, and the business sector. And we work together to ensure that we adapt. And our adaptation program include ensuring that industries themselves tries to work in a manner that avoid pollution uh, in the country. We are exploring more green options through waste management biodiversity economy, low economy, green tourism, uh, and others. The number of researches that we are conducting, aiming to ensure that we create more jobs, but ensure that we preserve the nature. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you for that, and uh, hello, everybody. Um, Scotland is in a, a rather particular position, um, as are many uh, nations and regions uh, like ours. Um, we were, in fact, one of the first countries in the world to declare uh, a climate emergency. Um, and we have only in the last year um, passed legislation for Scotland because um, climate change uh, and environmental policy is an entirely um, Scottish affair. Um, our, our climate change targets are to reach net zero by 2045 um, as against the UK government's climate change targets for the whole of the UK which are to reach net zero by 2050. So um, we are um, anticipating uh, to be there five years earlier with very challenging targets set for 2030 at a 75% emissions reduction. So you can see that from the point of view of our uh, climate change work, we've set ourselves an incredibly ambitious uh, task. Uh, and that, just, uh, that does uh, mean that we are on a, a rather different road uh, to the rest of the UK and much faster. There are a number of uh, things, however, that we're also doing. Um, uh, really, from our own perspective, we were the first country in the world to legislate into being a Just Transition Commission. And the Just Transition Commission um, uh, came into being in September 2018. It's been working incredibly hard, helping us enormously, because we are very concerned that the climate change uh, uh, work that needs to be done in the coming years should not leave people and whole sections of populations uh, behind. It's extremely important that we take Just Transition enormously seriously. Um, and we've been trying to do that uh, all the way along. Um, we are able to be more ambitious than the rest of the UK because of the nature of our geography. Um, we're very much a, a maritime nation. We have a massive coastline, uh, peatland, uh, uh, the ability to reforest in a way that perhaps is more difficult for the rest of the UK, massive uh, advantage in renewable energy uh, resources. Uh, something like 25% of all Europe's renewable energy resources are here in Scotland, um, particularly uh, offshore um, with wind and waves. So we have some advantages, but that also gives us enormous challenges. Um, the final thing I want to say, though, is that we were also the first country in the world to set up a, uh, a climate justice fund that was to assist um, developing countries because we're very conscious uh, of the difference between um, what uh, the developed world has to do to right the wrongs of the last couple of centuries, because the people in the, in the still developing world are suffering the price of what we did in the past. Thank you. And both your governments are leaders. You're both co-chairs of the Under Two Coalition. How are you approaching the energy transition, especially as we think about recovering now from a global pandemic um, and setting an example for a diverse group of peer, state and regional governments? Cabinet Secretary. 
Well, well, I think I've already um, referred briefly to the energy resources that we um, already have here in Scotland, particularly the, the offshore wind and tidal resource. We have something like 12,000 square kilometres of, uh, of coastline. So for us, it's, it's, uh, it's something which is um, absolutely straightforward. Last year, more than 90% of our el electricity was actually generated by onshore and offshore wind, hydro, solar and biomass power. So we are making great strides. But of course, we're also an oil and gas nation. So we have to manage the transition, uh, not just faster because of the targets that we've set ourselves, but also from uh, an existing oil and gas industrial sector, which in terms of its infrastructure is going to be really important um, uh, in order to make that transition into the newer forms of energy production. So we're very, very um, conscious of that. We have an energy transition fund, which is directly helping um, businesses and uh, uh, localities to, to, to really maximise the opportunities that there are there. Um, and we've also got a massive um, £1.6 billion programme to transform heat in buildings and energy efficiency programmes. Um, because um, unlike many other parts of the world, Scotland's problem in terms of its buildings is the generation of heat, uh, not from air conditioning, obviously, if you know Scotland's climate it is from, from that heating and we really need to be able to do something about that. So we're investing as much as we possibly can in that. Um, and as I indicated earlier, the oil and gas sector is going to have quite a big role to play in that transition. Thank you. Premier. Uh, thanks. I think uh, from our point of view, we can emphasize that the world is facing two emergencies, the climate change uh, or the climate emergency and the COVID-19 emergency, and both need to be tackled immediately, but with the same vigor. We're quite impressed with the manner in which the world, but also our own country have responded to the challenge of this uh, pandemic. Uh, in the province of KwaZulu-Natal, we have a consensus on the need for transition from fossil fuel to energy, which is a clean energy mix. We are aggressively pushing green policies. One of the interventions is that the biggest city, uh, a Tebwini municipality, which is also called Deben, has begun to explore opportunities uh, that are afforded by solar-based uh, generation uh, of energy. They've already been running the solar water heater program, replacing or play, putting uh, solar water heaters throughout the city. But also as Guazulu Natal, we boast a massive sugarcane and timber industries which if beneficiated appropriately could result in major two energy uh, industries, the electricity co-generation, but also the fuel ethanol production. Already our government is, prior, uh, is piloting this. We've got two uh, special economic zones and these two special economic zones are also utilizing uh, partly uh, alternative energy to ensure that they generate uh, uh, electricity. We're working with the South African cane growers to pilot uh, the program that seeks to convert uh, sugar cane waste into electricity. But also as the province, we are working hard to ensure that we industrialize the rooftop uh, PV programs uh, in all areas, in all municipalities. But the private sector also is playing a role and we continue to engage with the private sector and they have participated in a number of uh, energy generation projects. This include the generation of 60 megawatt energy from biomass to electrify 60,000 households and the feasibility study is on for this program. So we are working together and what we are emphasizing is that policies get uh, successful if all stakeholders are mobilized and work together 
coordinated by government. Thank you. And I just have a final quick question about how you've gathered support from local communities um, and how you're working with those communities to get them on board with these ambitious climate targets. Uh, Premier first. Thank you. The question of public support and public participation is quite important, especially if we are all going to succeed, because if we want to go, we must also ensure that the community is participating. In the province of KwaZulu-Natal, we drive this mobilization of our citizens through the district development model, which is a model that seeks to ensure that the national government complement uh, the provincial government, but also the provincial government work with the local government. And this uh, is centered around one pillar which is called Operation Sukumasake, and this uh, seek to mobilize the participation of all stakeholders in communities. This include traditional leaders, but it also include NGOs and other stakeholders. We also believe that for us to successfully mobilize communities, African communities have always been mobilized through the use of indigenous knowledge system to preserve their ecosystem and the environment. So through Operation Sukumasake, we work to bring more education and educate our people on how to preserve uh, the, the environment. We are working hard and this is impacting by providing basic knowledge on hygiene, uh, try to ensure that we preserve rivers prevent the pollution of the sea and also ensure that we educate people on how to avert disasters such as lightning and floods. Thank you. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you, Helen. And I, I would agree, I think, with the general thrust of what the Premier has just said. Governments cannot do this on their own. We need the private sector, we need the third sector, we need uh, action at community level and at individual level. And all of that needs to come together. So it is incredibly important that we are able to communicate uh, properly across all of those different sectors. Um, we are lucky in Scotland uh, in, the, in a parliamentary sense. There isn't any um, opposition to what needs to be done. So that the legislation that I was talking about um, last year went through with support right across the political spectrum in Scotland, in the Parliament. And that, that is an enormous benefit to us. But of course, um, as leaders, as politicians, we have to be able to get out there and sell things, um, sell that message. So we've done a number of things that I, I think are quite important. We, we put in place a climate challenge fund back in 2008 which delivered grant funding right into communities um, at the level of community groups who put together projects, um, put their bids up, would get funded for doing things. Um, and that helped us to actually make that message real at that community level. And we're also this year, although for reasons connected to the pandemic, this has been delayed this year, but we are in the process um, of setting up a Citizens Climate Assembly. Again, to try and reach out right across the piece to hear from people um, what they think can and cannot be done. And, and we're, you know, from a government perspective, we're going to roll out hubs. And it's interesting to hear the Premier talking about what they're doing, because I suspect if we looked at it, we would find that we were doing quite similar things. Um, these hubs will allow for uh, more um, local and regional um, coordination um, of a lot of the activity, which I think is incredibly important. Um, but I do think it's worth emphasising that for all of us in every part of the world, this has to be a national endeavour. Governments cannot do this on their own. And I cannot emphasise that more strongly. The presumption that we can just sit back and let governments come up with all the solutions doesn't work. Um, and it does need to be a huge um, conversation that involves absolutely everybody. And it has to cross all our boundaries.
all our boundaries, internal and external. Thank you very much. Thanks very much to both of you um, for this session and for your leadership on this issue. And we really appreciate you, uh, your work as co-chairs of the Under Two Coalition. And thank you very much for joining us at Climate Week NYC. Thank you. Thank you. And thanks uh, for having us in this program. Thank you. So that brings an end to our flagship session on the green economic recovery. I'd like to thank all of our speakers for their contributions to a fascinating event today. And I'd also like to thank all of you for listening in around the world and being part of the Hub Live. But there's still plenty more to come today. There's now around 35 minutes of time for interactive networking and our exhibition for attendees where you can meet your fellow delegates and visit some of the booths. Then we'll be back after that here in the auditorium for the Walmart Sustainability Milestone Summit, which brings together a stellar lineup of CEOs from business and civil society organisations. I hope that you enjoyed the session as much as I did, and we'll see you all again soon.